Good morning. Uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by the National Nanotechnology Infrastructure Networks Computation Program at the University of Michigan. Uh, before I introduce today's presenter, uh, here are a few housekeeping tips. Uh, all participants have been muted in order to avoid background noise. If you have questions, please use the uh, Q&A tab on your browser window and post your questions. We will have them answered at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. And if you would like to view a copy of the thing, you can do so by logging in on the NNI at University of Michigan website in a couple of days. Our presenter for today is Dr. Amar S. Basu. He is an assistant professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Wayne State University. Uh, professor Basu received his BS, uh, MS in Electrical Engineering, uh, MS in Biomedical Engineering, and a PhD in Electrical Engineering all with honors from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He has worked with Intel's Advanced Technology Group, General Motors, Silicon Graphics, and also has served as an adjunct faculty at the University of Michigan. Uh, his work is primarily supported by the NSF and, is, and focuses on microfluidic and microelectronic te technologies for high throughput screening and distributed healthcare. Uh, Professor Basu has also received the IEEE Professor of the Year Award in 2009 and the Whitaker Foundation Fellowship in 2005. Uh, without further ado, over to you, Professor Bach. Professor, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the NNI, uh, NNINC webinar uh, on multi-phase computational fluid dynamics for droplet-based microfluidics. As Pramesh said, my name is Amar Basu. I'm an assistant professor in the Electrical and Biomedical Engineering Department at Wayne State University. And a large part of the, our lab's work is in the area of droplet microfluidics, including simulation. So without further ado, let's just get started. Uh, we have about one hour. And uh, the way I was planning to do this webinar is that I will speak for the first uh, 45 to 50 minutes or so. I'll try to keep close to that. <laughs> and uh, we'll begin with an uh, introduction to droplet microfluidics. And then we'll talk about how multi-phase uh, CFD is, uh, can be used to model uh, droplet microfluidics. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the basic concepts of multi-phase CFD, particularly how it differs from single-phase CFD. And for examples, we'll talk about uh, basic droplet operations like generation, mixing, merging, and splitting, those basic fluid handling operations. And then we'll move on to more uh, complex uh, phenomena such as uh, looking inside the drops to see what uh, the plug flow and the internal vortices that occur and how you can use those to concentrate particles inside the plugs. Uh, we'll talk about how you can move, uh, manipulate droplets using uh, focused laser beams, the technique called optofluidic tweezers, and then also a technique called tensiophoresis for drop sorting. In all these uh, phenomena, these last three are actually areas that our lab is working in. And, um, we're going to emphasize how computational fluid dynamics have helped us in understanding these phenomena because these are uh, these typically involve uh, more interfacial flows they involve uh, interfacial tension gradients so uh, these are slightly modified versions of the traditional uh, multi-phase CFD model so I'm going to try to finish that up in about uh, 50 minutes or so so we'll have the last 10 minutes for uh, questions however if you have any uh, burning questions uh, please do feel free to uh, share them uh, either with the staff or through the chat window, and I'll do my best to uh, address them if, if it's uh, possible. So let's begin by just discussing a little bit about droplet microfluidics, just to give a motivation for why people are working in this field, uh, especially for those of you who are not familiar with it. High throughput screening is an area of uh, a biotechnology where you basically do a lot of assays, uh, tens, hundreds, or thousands of different assays, where you mix a target with uh, a specific library of reagents. So let me give you an example. In the pharmaceutical industry, you may want to have um, a, a cell or a, a biomolecular target of interest, and you want to um, test a library of uh, chemical reagents against that target. Uh, Pharmaceutical companies routinely test uh, hundreds of thousands of different compounds or millions of compounds per week. Uh, in the biotechnology industry, uh, you have libraries of proteins, uh, you have libraries of PCR primers used in gene expression assays, 
in environmental and public health applications, you have libraries of organic compounds to test for toxicity. But the basic idea is the same. You're basically running a whole bunch of chemical reactions. And uh, there's been sort of a miniaturization trend in the high throughput screening industry. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, as the, um, the, the size of our chemical libraries increases, we have to be able to do, uh, we have to be able to screen larger libraries at the, um, at the same cost. So we've seen a miniaturization trend similar to electronics where in the 1980s, before the 1980s, we had 6, 12, 24, and 48 well plates. In the 80s, the 1996 well plate was introduced and we've gradually moved towards larger and larger plate formats. Uh, since the 2000s. So the demand curve has been moving this way. Uh, there are, all the microplates are in the same uh, general footprint, so the assay volumes are decreasing at the same time. So once we get below one microliter, uh, there are barriers to further miniaturization. You have issues with evaporation, liquid handling, the precision of the robots picking liquid up from one well and putting it into another, and then you also have issues with surface absorption. Uh, one of the reasons why many uh, folks are working in the droplet microfluidics field is that they, they can bring us here on the curve. They can bring us down to nanoliter and picoliter volume and the equivalent of uh, up to a million reactions per plate. So this can help meet uh, the demand from curve that's coming in the next, uh, in the next decade, decade or so. So this is where droplet microfluidics comes in. Uh, if you compare a traditional microplate assay, your sample volume is on the order of milliliters to microliters. If you do a traditional microchannel based assay where the entire channel is filled, you can get your sample volume down from microliters to nanoliters. If you can find the fluid in two dimensions and you run your assay inside an emulsion, inside a water in oil droplet, you can get sample volumes down from the nanoliters actually down to the femtoliters. So this is one of the advantages. And um, not only does this allow you to reduce your reagent consumption, which saves cost, so there's an economic benefit to this, it also allows you to do new types of assays that you wouldn't uh, be able to do before. For example, you can start working with single cell confined assays where you can actually measure the amount of um, a protein or enzyme excreted by the cell. And if you were to, if you were to do the same assay in, um, in a traditional Petri dish, uh, that would obviously become diluted and you wouldn't be able to sense it. But uh, when you have a confined uh, reaction container, you can start to do these types of uh, very interesting science. So the field of droplet microfluidics has really grown over the last, uh, uh, since its inception, the last 10 years or so. So in this field, water and oil droplets are used as reaction containers, as I mentioned earlier. It's worth noting that the oil serves as a physical uh, um, barrier between the droplets and the walls. So this prevents, prevents cross-contamination between the individual droplets and also cross-contamination of the channel walls. So it, it enhances the uh, reusability of the device. There's several nice examples. I've only touched on a few here. Uh, some of the early work was done by Rustem Ismagilov's group at the University of Chicago, now at Caltech. Um, this was some work on droplet generation. Uh, shown in the middle here is uh, Rus uh, Rustem Ismagilov's work on the um, uh, protein crystallization. Here we have uh, continuous flow PCR. This was uh, the manufacturing of uh, polymers, complex polymers using double emulsion. And here we have um, uh, some uh, commercial commercialization of this technology. So this is some work by Raindance Technologies, which was founded by David Waits' lab, and some work by uh, Biorad and Life Technologies. Uh, a lot of this work is in digital PCR. OK. So uh, moving on then, uh, we're going to talk now about uh, simulation. Uh, when you look at multi-phase simulation versus single phase, uh, you have some issues that you have to uh, deal with. With single phase, you're generally dealing with the Navier-Stokes and the continuity equation. You're dealing with slip, non-slip boundary conditions. And in some cases, you're also dealing with the energy equation if you're doing thermal simulations. If you're also, if you're doing species transport, you're dealing with the diffusion equation. With single phase microfluidics, uh, you can often simplify the channels into first order models. Uh, and generate lumped element models to model these uh, channel networks. It's, it's done quite often. 
but with multi-phase microfluidics, this type of thing is not quite, uh, it's not quite so simple. Uh, because you have all of the above equations that you're modeling, and you also have the boundary conditions at the fluid interface. Uh, you have surface tension uh, forces, Laplace pressures. Uh, you have interfacial flows. And uh, of course, in multi-phase fluidics, when you're looking at the movement of droplets, all your simulations end up being time dependent. So uh, really, these uh, simulations start to become more complex to analyze, especially when you have uh, different types of channel geometries. So it really is useful to be able to uh, do simulations on these types of devices. And for that reason, uh, multi-phase CSD will play an equal or more important role in the development of multi-phase microfluidics devices as they have uh, played a very important role in single-phase microfluidics technology development. So here are the equations uh, used to model single-phase microfluidics. Up at the top here, we have the conservation of mass. And that is equal to 0 in the case of incompressible flow. Next, we have the equations of conservation of momentum, or the Navier-Stokes. And this is also showing the incompressible forms. Uh, these two red arrows uh, show the terms that cancel out in the case of low Reynolds number flow, which is typically what happens in a microfluidic channel. Uh, and in low bond number, also, which occurs in the, uh, um, at low Reynolds number and in small geometry. Uh, low Reynolds number means the uh, viscous effects are much more significant than the inertial effects. And the low bond number means you basically ignore the effect of gravity. So the equation uh, simplifies somewhat. But in addition to this equation, you also have the uh, coupled physics to model in chemical diffusion, um, heat transport, or electric fields. When you're working with multi-phase, you have to add another set of equations. So this is the level set model of the two-phase interface. So this is actually what uh, we generally use uh, in our simulation. A very elegant and simple way of modeling the two-phase interface is to introduce a variable called phi, the level set variable. And the value of phi is equal to 0 in the continuous phase, with 0 out in the oil. And it's equal to 1 inside the dispersed phase, so inside the droplet. Now, this function varies continuously at the interface. So it's equal to 0 0.5 uh, right at the interface. And so by introducing this auxiliary function, we can actually model a moving droplet or a moving interface on a fixed grid, which is very important because if you have a moving, uh, if you have to move your grid or move your mesh, then things start to become uh, very complicated. So this is a very elegant way of modeling this interface. Uh, when we do this, we have to uh, consider several different equations. First of all, we have to consider the movement of the interface, the interaction of the fluid with the interface. So we have the uh, equation here labeled interface advection. Uh, d phi dt plus the divergence of u times phi is equal to 0 in the case of, so the right-hand side of this equation will have 0 if we're dealing with a non-conservative level set method. If we're dealing with a conservative level, level set method, we are going to have these tuning parameters, including uh, alpha and epsilon and the right-hand side of the equation that you see here. Uh, these tuning parameters are used to um, uh, uh, control the stability and the speed of the reinitialization step in the level set method. So they are uh, important parameters that you can tune. Um, in many cases, the default parameters in our simulator work fine. We're using COMSOL for our work. And in other cases, you may have to tune some of them in order to get the simulation to converge. Uh, the second equation that you see here is calculating the interface normal. You have to calculate a vector that's perpendicular to the interface. So let me just show you what that means. We have uh, these uh, vector fields here, which points from inside of the drop to the outside of the drop. And this is actually very easy to calculate. You just use the uh, divergence of the level set variable. The third equation you see here is the curvature. Very important to be able to calculate the curvature in, in, order, to, um, in order to calculate uh, surface tension effect. And that can be uh, calculated simply by taking the divergence of the interface normal vector at phi equals 0 0.5.
when we're looking at the specifically at the interface, the level set method can be used to model all the physics that occur. We have a surface tension force uh, that can be modeled by the interfacial tension times the curvature times the delta function times the, um, uh, the surface normal vector. Okay, so this is the, the value that is given will have the units of newtons per meter cubed. So this actually means newtons per meter squared, the difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the drop, which is the traditional Laplace pressure that we think of. But we also have this additional meters term on the bottom in the denominator, uh, which represents the size of the element. Okay, I'll talk about the meshing and elements in the subsequent slides. So the surface tension force can be calculated uh, using this equation. Now, the basic equation is, like I said, sigma times the curvature times the delta function, which is basically a smooth function which peaks at the interface multiplied by the interface normal. Um, but there's another form of this that's used in the simulator that makes things a little bit more stable. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it's shown right below. The uh, Laplace pressure is given by the difference in the pressures between inside and outside of the drop, and uh, that is given by 2 sigma times the curvature. The surface shear stress is given by the surface gradient of the interfacial tension, and that is very important in some of the later examples that you'll see where you can use uh, interfacial tension gradients to actually manipulate drops. Moving on, uh, the level set method is not the only um, type of model that we can use to, uh, to uh, enhance the physics of the interface. Uh, there are other methods as well, but we choose to use the uh, conservative level set methods and the phase field methods that are uh, highlighted in red here. It's worth it to just mention what else is out there. Uh, the front tracking method uses uh, marker particles to no denote the interface. So it treats the marker particles as uh, these particles that move around in your fluid, and the location of those marker particles will denote what the interface is. So the strength of this technique is that you get a very sharp interface. However, the weakness is that it's inaccurate, and it can't really handle well the ex expansion of, uh, of the droplet. It has difficulty in handling topological changes, uh, particularly sharp corners. The volume of fluid method uh, uses a, um, a field variable, very much like the conservative level set method does. But the issue with that one is that it's discontinuous at the interface. The strength is that it's conservative and it uh, conserves mass, and it can deal with topological changes, unlike the front tracking method. But it's generally inaccurate due to this discontinuity of the um, of the variable, the color function, which is one inside, zero outside, but it doesn't vary continuously at the interface. The conservative level set method was was uh, the level set method was originally started in the 90s, but then the conservative level set method was shown. Um, in the early 2000s, and that is the, what is used in many simulators today. Uh, it uses a continuous level set function, which varies uh, gradually through the interface, so it's a diffuse interface. You can obtain an accurate surface tension calculation and a reasonable calculation of the um, a wetting film. So those are the strengths. The weaknesses is, is that you do have a diffuse interface, so uh, you have to account for that. It's difficult to model uh, molecular level uh, interface effects, uh, but you can't really do that with any of the other techniques also. So it really is um, a uh, relatively good technique. Like I said, the earlier um, incar um, incarnations of the level set method <coughs> had problems with mass loss. In other words, the droplets would basically shrink. Uh, but once the conservative level set method was introduced, some of these problems uh, uh, went away. The phase field method is uh, a cousin of the level set method, which uses an energy model to model the, uh, the surface energy of the interface. Um, there's a higher computational cost, but it has um, a multi-physics uh, coupling, a uh, good multi-physics coupling, which is useful for um, uh, various types of um, simulations where you may be modeling the um, uh, interactions with an electric field or so on. I'm going to mostly focus on the level set method. 
Just a few notes about the finite element method. It's a numerical method to solve partial differential equations, and it relies on meshing the, the spatial domain into elements. The finer the mesh, the more accurate the solution, but the longer the simulation time. The finite element method uses an iterative process to calculate the solution of all the coupled field variables. And you can add uh, different physics into the simulation. For example, you can add an electric field and couple it to your field variables, and uh, the finite element solver will use a, um, a coupled field model in order to solve for all of the field variables in an iterative process. Especially when you're doing multi-physics, converging a solution can sometimes be tricky, and so that's a point of note. Just the four basic steps of finite element modeling. You start off by building the geometry, then you move on to uh, define your boundary conditions and your models and your material properties. You begin with the models, of course. In many cases, uh, in these cases, we're si just simulating uh, uh, two-phase flow. And uh, we would put in the material properties accordingly, so viscosity and uh, density and so on. We would enter our boundary conditions. I'll go over those on the next slide. After you put in the boundary conditions, you'll mesh the model into these small elements. And when you mesh the model, uh, these field variables, uh, the variation in the can be represented as piecewise linear functions within each element. So um, your problem becomes a set of linear equations, a matrix of linear equations, which can be solved using um, uh, a matrix solver. And that solution happens, as I mentioned, uh, iteratively. And it computes all the field variables at all the given times. And then once you have that solution completed, you can do post-processing and view the various um, uh, results. In this case, we're looking at the geometry of the drops, and we're looking at the uh, velocity. A very important part of finite element simulations is uh, putting in the right material properties and boundary conditions. What I've done on this slide is I've put the uh, uh, properties and boundary conditions specific to multi-phase flow. I've highlighted them in blue so you can see. Uh, viscosity and density are common to any fluid simulation. Uh, when you're dealing with multi-phase, you have to do interfacial tension. Inlet and outlet boundary conditions, typically you'll put a pressure or flow condition at the inlet or outlet. And in the case of multi-phase, you also have to add the volume fraction. So you have to indicate which fluid is entering the, um, uh, the inlet, for example. Fluid 1, which might represent the oil, and fluid 0, which represents water. Uh, with the walls of your simulation, um, you know, conventional fluidic simulation might have no slip, slip, moving walls, and so on. With multi-phase, you also have this option of a wetted wall, where you specify a contact angle. You also indicate uh, at the initial time of the simulation what the initial fluid is, whether it's fluid zero or fluid one, whether it's water or oil. And it's also helpful to indicate the initial interface, uh, where the boundary is between the water and the oil, uh, because this is used to initialize the level set function. There's a reinitialization step that also occurs, uh, but the, at the beginning of the simulation, there's an initial, initial initialization step uh, where it's helpful if you know where the location of the fluid interface is. So these are some examples uh, which hopefully will illustrate some of the complexities of uh, multi-phase flow. This is a simulation result of just a basic 2D uh, plug flow in a microfluid channel. And what you see on this graph here is the, uh, the pressure as a function of position. Now, you can see that the pressure jumps at the boundary of each drop, OK? So you get this nonlinear pressure profile. If you compare this to a single phase flow, in a single phase flow, you would just see a linear uh, pressure profile. But here, due to the Laplace pressure, uh, at the curved boundary of each drop, you see these jumps in pressure, OK? The value of this jump in pressure is it depends on the interfacial tension. It depends on the curvature of the interface. A very nice paper describing uh, multi-phase plug flow is a, um, a lab on a chip paper 2011 by Charles Baroud and some of his group, uh, Remy Dangla as well. 
uh, it has some of the equations, but it also makes you appreciate some of the complexities here because there are, for example, uh, some empirical numbers such as the channel geometry C and the number of droplets, which has to be, you know, it's going to uh, change depending on what your experimental conditions are. Uh, another uh, point of note is that you have to consider the viscosity ratio between the, the droplet phase and the continuous phase. So uh, you're not able to model these uh, these systems in a simple lumped element circuit model as you would be able to do with single phase flow. Now that we've just talked a little bit about the basics of a typical result, let's talk about the different droplet unit operations. And I'm going to move through these fairly quickly just in the interest of time. Uh, we'll start out with drop generation. And some of the parameters used that are important in drop generation are the size and frequency of drops and also the ability to generate monodispersed droplets. In most cases, you have uh, a flow focusing drop generator uh, where you basically combine a stream of aqueous fluid with two streams of oil in, in a microfluidic confined geometry. And you can see that what, uh, you know, roughly what happens is, is that the oil squeezes the uh, aqueous phase, causing it to neck and break up into a stream of drops. This is a simulation, I'm sorry, this is a simulation here on the left, and on the right side we have um, some, a basic drop generator that we fabricated in our lab. So uh, the multi-phase actually is very useful for um, illustrating the mechanism of breakup and also for exploring the effects of geometry and material properties. For example, in a drop generator we have the squeezing regime, we have the dripping regime, and as we'll see later, we also have the, the jetting regime. In the squeezing regime, the size of the drops is largely dependent on the channel geometry and to a lesser extent dependent on the, um, uh, the flow rate ratio between the two phases. And the dripping regime is very dependent on the capillary number, so your interfacial tension uh, starts to play a role, the viscosity starts to play a role, and the velocity starts to play a role. So it becomes le uh, more difficult to generate a monodispersed stream of drops. This slide shows the mechanism of drop breakup uh, in the squeezing regime, which is the regime that we prefer to use. Uh, I show you this slide because it's, uh, I just want to illustrate that when you, when you do a simulation, you can plot all the variables, which is something that you can't obtain when you're doing experiments. In this case, we've plotted all the velocity vectors, we've plotted all the uh, pressure uh, values, and uh, as well as the interface. So, I should note that this is a 2D simulation, okay, but it still allows you to um, observe the physics of the drop breakup and get an intuition of how this drop breakup mechanism works. And this is really important when you're, uh, you know, when you're starting off as a grad student, you're starting off from the field, or even if, if, if you've worked in this area for a while, developing that intuition is very important for designing new types of devices. So let's give an example here. In the squeezing regime, the break-off process happens in four steps. First, the droplet phase enters a junction. So you can see the aqueous phase will enter here. When the aqueous phase fills up this region, it blocks the oil on the top and bottom inlet. So when that happens, you get an increase in the pressure. Due to that pressure increase, uh, the droplet, well, the droplet blocks the channel, as I mentioned earlier. You get a pressure build buildup. This causes the droplet to neck and elongate. And in the fourth step, the droplet pinches off. So this is an oscillatory behavior. And uh, if you just look at the pressure profile within one of these inlets here, over time, you'll see that there's actually a, a threefold uh, pressure variation, which is quite significant. And so, in an actual device, uh, you actually get a very fast pressure fluctuation at the inlet when you're uh, doing a, um, a constant flow rate. If you're driving these things at constant pressure, the situation changes. I haven't shown this just in the interest of time, but you get the idea. So, you can really get an understanding of the breakup uh, mechanism process. If you extend this to three dimensions, you can start to model real devices. The, um, the disadvantages, of course, is computationally expensive. This simulation that you see here, it had about 20,000 elements, required 1.5 gigs of memory, and took 
close to five hours to run. So um, you may want to run these things overnight. Uh, so if you're exploring these over uh, a bunch of parameters, it does take a long time to run. But the advantage is that it does give you three-dimensional effects, which you can't model in an axisymmetric or two-dimensional simulation. For example, you have Healy-Shaw effects, which basically means when, the, when a spherical droplet is squeezed into a pancake-like shape in a shallow channel, you start to get extra drag at the top and bottom of the channel. Um, you also have a, a rectangular channel, and you have these uh, curved surfaces in a rectangular channel. You end up getting these things called corner gutters, which you can see that's illustrated in the cross section here. Um, what we've done here is taken a slice of the channel here, and this black boundary represents the droplet interface. And you can see that that interface expands and contracts as the droplets flow through the channel. And you get these uh, very interesting nonlinear uh, velocity profiles. In this case, we've actually plotted the velocity and the colors here. And you get a Poisset flow profile if the, if the drop is not there. And when the drop is introduced, you get this uh, sharp discontinuities at the boundary. You can start to understand more about a plug flow this way. Another thing this allows you to do is to understand the different flow regimes. Uh, a very important uh, transition that occurs in drop generation devices is a transition from the squeezing to the dripping to the jetting regime. And you can see that uh, nicely here in a three-dimensional simulation. At low capillary numbers, by the way, the capillary number is mu times the velocity divided by the interfacial tension. At low capillary numbers, you see that we're in the squeezing regime where this drop breakoff occurs uh, through this uh, the four-step process that I indicated earlier. When you go to higher uh, capillary numbers, you start to see uh, a transition into the dripping regime, where this uh, uh, the you start to see the uh, the beginning of a jet that starts to break off break off further downstream. When you go to even higher capillary numbers, this jet continues much further down the stream. You start to see these oscillations in the pattern here. And uh, uh, the drop breakoff actually ends up becoming a lot less predictable. So these simulations that you see here actually do match up relatively well to uh, experimental results. So when you do three-dimensional work, it starts to become a design tool. You can also do empirical modeling, again, just to get an intuition of how the different parameters affect the process. These are two-dimensional simulations, so there's a little bit less uh, physically relevant, but they do illustrate the effect of, let's say, channel geometries and material properties. You can compare the effect of a non-uniform cross versus the cross, uh, basic cross that we showed earlier. Uh, you can show what the effect of the neck is, that you can get a smaller droplets in a larger channel. And then on the right side here, you can see the effects of material properties. Uh, what happens if the oil is one cent stoke versus a thousand cent stoke? This changes the capillary number. So in, in effect, um, uh, this larger viscosity carrier fluid will have a lower capillary number, so you end up getting smaller drops, and you'll be in the squeezing uh, regime. Um, but it, it's nice to be able to see, the, um, to gain an intuition on, on how the larger viscosity affects this drop generation process. So moving on to mixing. I'll touch on a, uh, um, a very basic mixer uh, where you have uh, a train of drops coming in on the left side, and then you have an aqueous stream coming in the top here. So uh, you can use simulations to model at what flow rate this drop uh, breakoff process and uh, mixing process will be self-synchronized. Uh, you can do the actual experiment. Uh, this was done with just traditional laboratory uh, uh, tubing. Uh, we published a paper earlier just showing that you can do the drop generation and mixing process using standard components. Uh, this avoids the use of photolithography and makes it accessible to a larger number of labs. This is just a slide showing that. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Uh, other droplet mixer designs you can explore, uh, a T-junction design, a cross-junction design. In one case, you have unidirectional shear. In the other case, you have bidirectional shear. Uh, so you get a faster drop breakoff and lower likelihood of cross-contamination. You can explore these different types of designs by doing these two-dimensional simulations just to get some intuition. 
Um, when you go down to the smaller scale, that basic way of uh, combining a droplet train with a stream doesn't work. And so you have to uh, use other techniques. And one very popular and elegant way of doing this was published by Andrew DeMello's group, in Lab on a Chip. You can see in the movie here that uh, what happens is that one drop uh, goes into this region, what we call uh, a filler region. And when it enters that filler region, it basically stops. The subsequent drop uh, comes in, the two drops merge, and the merged droplet is then brought out and uh, in, into the following into the subsequent channel. This is a very interesting uh, device in relying on the uh, hydrodynamics of the pillar region. It's very nice to be able to model this using CFD and gain an intuition of how it works. I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, but just to gain an appreciation for this, there are a lot of geometric parameters. There's spacing between the pillars. There is the uh, um, spacing between the pillars and the walls of the channel. And then there's the length of this uh, region here. There's a lot of different geometric parameters, and it also depends on material properties. So if you have a multi-phase model, you can explore the effect of these properties. So this next slide here shows the actual merging mechanism. And it actually illustrates the, uh, the specific steps involved in this merging process. The first step is the drainage of the carrier fluid. When this plug enters this pillar region, uh, the oil separating the two drops begins to flow into these um, into the adjacent regions here, as you can see by the yellow arrow. That causes a drainage of the continuous phase, and the subsequent drop um, comes in and goes into contact with the, uh, um, the first drop. In the next step, the merging process happens. When this film separating the two drains away, uh, this, this merging can happen spontaneously. Now, the, the process becomes a little bit more complex if you have surfactants involved. Um, the multi-phase CSD at the current time cannot model uh, surfactant uh, behavior, but uh, it does show the spontaneous merging of the two drops in this device. And that is an interfacial tension dependent model. <coughs> so when the drop, uh, when the merged droplet forms in the device, now you can see that it's completely uh, filled this filler region. So the oil begins to flow in a recirculation pattern here, and the oil will literally push the droplet out uh, of this filler region. Okay, that doesn't occur in the case of a small drop, but it will occur in the larger merged drop. And the third step is the removal of the merged drop. In this case, you can see that you get these recirculations on the top and bottom, and then you get a flow in the middle which pushes um, on the plug until it leaves the merging area. So these results match up quite nicely, actually, with, with the uh, experimental results, results reported by um, Andrew DeMello's uh, group. Moving on to another operation of uh, drop splitting. Drop splitting can be done using a, a fork in the channel. And then multi-phase CFD can be used to uh, kind of uh, analyze the geometrically mediated drop splitting. This is where you have um, a non-uniform fork. We have an inlet here that's 75, uh, 100 micron inlet, 75 micron outlet. But these forks have the, the dimensions as shown, 50-50, 60-40 micron, and then 75-25. Uh, a very nice paper that was published in 2004 uh, showed that uh, depending on the hydraulic resistance of these two forks, you'll get different size uh, a different ratio of plug splitting. And indeed, we can see that in our simulations as well. What you notice is that it's, it's not a linear process. Okay, you have a 50-50 will give you a, uh, a uniform splitting, but a 60-40 won't give you a 60-40 ratio of, of plug size. This is because this process is nonlinear. Uh, the, um, the hydraulic resistance of the channel depends on uh, the length cubed in the case of rectangular channels, uh, radius to the fourth in the case of circular channels. So it's a non-linear non phenomena. And you can see here that in the case of a 75-25 fork, you don't get any splitting at all. So you can use uh, simulations to kind of understand uh, the splitting process and also to gain, um, if you're doing three-dimensional simulations, they can give you uh, relevant results for your design. So now that we've covered some of the basics uh, I'd like to move on to one other process, which is actually not shown here, 
but it uh, uses multi-phase CFT to understand what is happening inside the drop. So we're doing particle concentration here. Um, for modeling plug flow, uh, you can see that when the plug moves through the channel, you end up getting these vortices inside the drop. Okay, and this is actually nicely shown in some of the simulations that we've done. Uh, by drawing the streamlines inside a two-dimensional simulation, you can see if you draw those streamlines within the reference frame of the drop, you'll see that you get forward flow in the middle of the drop and reverse flow um, on the edges of the drop. So this creates a recirculation pattern called the internal vortices. And the shape of these vortices changes depending on how fast the droplet is moving uh, or how fast the plug is moving through the capillary. So it becomes a very interesting thing that you can model and try to understand. Uh, and you can also use these flows for doing particle concentration, as I'll show you later. Uh, this is a simulation of uh, the vortices that show up inside the drop. Again, this is a two-dimensional simulation, but uh, you do start to see these types of patterns in uh, experimental as well. Uh, this simulation actually shows how the geometry of these vortices changes with uh, increasing capillary number. In other words, with increasing velocity of the plug in the channel. Uh, you can see that the, um, the, the length of the vortex in the front actually becomes smaller as you go to larger capillary number. You can start to get an understanding of the geometry of the vortices and also the shape of the plug. You can actually see that um, the drop actually becomes uh, um, elongated and um, elongated. You get a necking effect at higher capillary numbers. So um, we use this uh, circulation effect to actually concentrate particles and plugs. Uh, so what we have here is you have these vortex flows that occur inside the plug, and you also have these particles. And these particles have a larger diameter so that they actually sediment due to gravity. In the case where the velocity of circulation is much larger than the velocity, uh, the settling velocity of the particles, you'll end up getting a situation where the particles circulate throughout the plug. This is what occurs at um, at high shields number. The shields number is just the, uh, the ratio of circulation velocity to settling velocity. When the two start to become comparable, when your shields number starts to become on the order of unity, you start to see the concentration effect. So the particles will begin to travel through the length of the plug, but they will also settle at a, uh, at a certain rate that's comparable. And they'll start to form, uh, they'll start to circulate in um, a region that you see here. And there will be a certain length of the circulation zone that scales with the shield number. And then when you get to a um, very small shield number, you'll see that, that you'll get a particle concentration effect in the backside of the plug. So you can use this then to actually do uh, bead-based assays in plugs. Uh, we don't have that much time, so I'm just going just to run through this real quick. Um, a bead-based assay occurs in three steps. You want to um, agitate your beads with the sample, concentrate them, and then extract out the, uh, uh, the drops containing only the beads. And you can start to do that. These are some preliminary results here. I'm going to skip over this slide. OK, moving on to drop transport. Now, when we're, uh, our group is looking at techniques for manipulating drops using uh, the phoretic propulsion. Phoretic propulsion basically means that uh, the droplet is propelling itself. Uh, we don't have too much time to go over all these techniques here, but uh, these show some uh, initial techniques people have used to get self-propelling particles and droplets. So we are uh, using interfacial tension gradients uh, to manipulate drops using uh, the phenomenon of capillary migration. The basic idea is this. If you have um, a droplet, the droplet has a surface energy equal to the interfacial tension times the area. So if you put a droplet in a, um, a space where there's a non-uniform interfacial tension, the droplet will migrate uh, in order to reduce its overall surface energy. From a more physical model, which you can see from this uh, CFD simulation here, is that you get these Marangoni microvortices that cause the droplet to literally swim, uh, do a breaststroke, as I like to say, uh, move from the high interfacial tension to the low interfacial tension. So in these types of situations, we have a, a modified model which allows a spatial variation in interfacial tension. And, and the really nice thing about this model is that the, um, all the flow effects just uh, come out. Uh, it very nicely models 
the, uh, this migration effect, and you can also see the deformation of the drop. So Marangoni flow is always uh, um, oriented from low interfacial tension to high. So when you uh, create this gradient here, this causes these two, um, it causes an actually symmetric, uh, it's called the hill spherical vortices, which cause the droplet to swim towards the low interfacial tension region. In the case of linear gradients, there's actually an analytical model to uh, look at this. However, when the gradients become nonlinear, it's helpful to have CSD. So in this case, we've simulated one way to do this is by heating. If we have a focused laser beam on one side of the plug, it creates a non-uniform interfacial tension here, and it creates these uh, flow vectors. Okay, and you can see that the uh, velocity of the flow vectors uh, increases with increasing interfacial tension. You can see that uh, uh, this models the temperature as well as the flow field. This simulation actually shows the, the manipulation of droplets using um, a spatially varying interfacial tension. We, so these are actually transit simulations. If we have a focused laser beam and a material which absorbs that laser beam inside the drop, uh, for example, a specific dye, we can create an interfacial tension gradient because interfacial tension and temperature are inversely related. So this simulation actually shows the trapping of a drop where the droplet literally gets pulled down in the cross section to where we have the focused laser beam. And then if we scan the laser beam back and forth, you can see the flow vectors that cause the droplet to uh, follow, essentially follow the laser beam. So we have a, a tweezer effect. We call this uh, optofluidic tweezers. And uh, the advantage of this effect is that it um, actually has forces on the order of micronewtons, which is about 100,000 times stronger than uh, the traditional optical tweezers. Now, the downside is that you have to have a liquid-liquid drop, but uh, it does allow you to manipulate um, uh, droplets much larger than what you could do with traditional optical tweezers. So this video here uh, shows the trapping and the actual uh, Marangoni flow that occurs inside the drop. This shows the translation and merging. In this last video here, we have a scanning laser, so you can uh, more visually see the fact that you can just use a focused laser beam and move these droplets around in a two-dimensional space. The last one I'd like to talk to you about, we're running a little bit late, but I'd like to take the last uh, uh, five, uh, five minutes or so to talk about this, and we'll have a few minutes for question and answer. Uh, uh, drop sorting. Uh, so again, we're using interfacial uh, tension processes to do uh, drop sorting. We use the same type of idea, high interfacial tension to low interfacial tension, except we implement this in a microfluidic channel. So we have two laminar streams flowing in parallel with each other. So we have low Reynolds number laminar flow. The upper stream contains a carrier plus surfactant. The bottom stream contains the same carrier fluid but no surfactant. So the interfacial tension depends on surfactant concentration. The upper stream will have lower interfacial tension. The bottom stream will have high interfacial tension. If we inject droplets into the bottom stream and the droplets are large enough, the droplet makes contact with this interface, uh, this Marangoni flow will begin and the droplet will migrate to the lower interfacial tension stream. Uh, by contrast, if you have small droplets that never make contact with this interface, that never see the low interfacial tension region, they will continue on um, as you would expect, and they would not be affected. And so this allows you a way to sort droplets in a channel by size. So these are the CFD simulations on the left. Now, this CFD simulation compares the effect of the surfactant. So we have the experiments on the right. If the two streams have the same interfacial tension, you see that the droplet just continues down uh, the channel unaffected, and we see the same in experiments. If you, um, uh, if you model two different interfacial tensions on the upper and lower half of the channel, you start to see this migration effect. And again, you start to see this in when you introduce a surfactant into the upper stream. As you increase the concentration of surfactants in the upper stream, uh, you have more of an interfacial tension difference between the two streams, and this migration effect becomes more drastic. You start to see a deformation in the drop due to the difference in Laplace pressures and a larger migration velocity. So we saw that the simulations actually match up fairly nicely to our experiment. So we've used this, like I said, to do size-based sorting. This is um, just a, a short video on 
uh, what happens to small droplets versus large droplets, and you can, uh, by having a bifurcation on the out, uh, on the later half of the channel, you can actually sort them by size. Uh, with relatively good precision, we get about 3.3% uh, size sorting re resolution. So uh, to conclude, uh, multi-phase flow is uh, complex. It can be non-intuitive. And so CSD can really help in the design and modeling from two perspectives. One, uh, like I said, it can develop an intuition, which is very important for um, uh, when it comes down to engineering any type of device, really. And the second thing is, uh, if you're willing to pay the larger computational expense, you can get experimentally relevant results if you do three-dimensional simulations with fine meshes. Uh, really quickly, um, CSD, what it can do is it can calculate nonlinear flow profiles, which are difficult to solve by hand. It can account for interfacial tension, Marangoni flow, with reasonable accuracy. It can account for Laplace pressures. It's very useful for uh, multi-phase, uh, droplet-based devices. It can help develop intuition, and it can complement experiments. What CSD cannot do is can't model the effects of surfactants, can't model uh, problems quickly. It takes time to run these simulations. Uh, I can't accurately predict very thin uh, Bretherton films. We didn't talk much about that, but that's the that's the separation of the wetting film between the uh, droplet and the channel walls. So you really you need a really fine mesh to resolve that, um, and it cannot substitute for experiments. It can only complement experiments. So looking ahead, uh, what is needed in this area? Uh, lumped element models can really reduce the computation time if you have a lot of droplets involved. Convergence can sometimes be problematic, although um, I think the most recent, recent version of the simulators are getting better and better. Um, Multi-scale models can connect molecular interfaces, what's happening with surfactants at the interface, to the larger continuum models. And then improvements in computational speed will, would also be helpful. I'd like to thank uh, the graduate students who worked on uh, some of the simulations, as well as m much of the experimental results. I'd like to thank the NNI, NNIN staff, uh, particularly uh, Baru Shiari and uh, Paramesh. Uh, Paramesh uh, sent out all the um, uh, promotional materials and, and really appreciate that. And uh, much of this, uh, the seminar and uh, all of our work, uh, the optic fluidic tweezers, the paresis, all of our work in drop fluidics has been sponsored by uh, the National Science Foundation. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. So we can start with uh, questions now. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, that was a very good uh, presentation. We have one question. Uh, uh, what size of droplets can you separate? And have you tried combining angioforesis with some other modes of separation, like electrophoretic or inertial separation? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, right now, uh, this is more of an experimental question, but uh, we're working with uh, drops that are comparable to the size of the channel right now. And uh, the nice thing about this kind of technique, if I can just back up here, is that when you're doing size-based separation, um, the size of the droplet that you can separate, you can nicely control that by just controlling the width of the stream here. And uh, you can very easily control that by just controlling the flow rate ratio between the, the stream carrying the carrier and surfactant and the lower stream which carries just the carrier fluid. So by adjusting WS you can get a very large dynamic tuning range which is something that um, uh, one of my students is actually working on right now. Uh, these are some results that we presented last year. So the answer to the question is um, there's a large size range of drops that you can separate going down to, from probably uh, a few tens of microns all the way up to a few hundreds of microns. Uh, we have another question. Uh, do you also work in atomizing spray nozzles? What is similar or different for the spray nozzle applications to microfluidics? I'm sorry, which applications? Could you repeat that, please? Uh, do you work in atomizing spray nozzles? What is similar or different for the spray nozzle application to microfluidics? Did you, did you say atomizing? Yeah, atomizing spray nozzles. At atomizing what? I'm sorry? Atomizing spray nozzles. Spain? Spray, spray. Atomizing sprays. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, th there are techniques which are used to analyze sprays. Um, we're focusing on droplet microfluidics here. Uh, 
there are some actually very good tools that are, are used in the automotive industry because um, analysis of sprays becomes very significant in fuel injectors. Um, there are uh, other methods that you can use, uh, Eulerian methods, or Eulerian methods, sorry, uh, which is useful when you have a lot of drop and you have a lot of complexity in your, uh, in your simulation. This uses a slightly different method. Um, we're focused on um, looking at what's happening inside the drops, whereas the spray simulations, you can't resolve what's happening inside. So we're, we're trying to do finer granularity here. Um, but th there's a, a very large body of work on spray simulations that I would uh, refer you to. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, Level set has some issues with the mass conservation. So how accurate do you think the conservative level set method is? You know, originally when we started doing these simulations, um, in earlier versions of the simulation tool that we used, the uh, console, uh, we had some issues with mass loss, but that, um, once we started using the conservative level set method, uh, the issues of mass loss really did disappear. It's, it, uh, in theory, the level set method, if you use the conservative form, it, it, it is perfect in terms of mass conservation. Uh, the trade-off is that the computational time is longer, and sometimes you have an issue with convergence. But um, if you decide to use the uh, conservative level set option, then uh, you should not have an issue with math loss. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Yeah, we have one more question. Uh, could you elaborate a little more about how laser force from surface tension is uh, 10 power x times larger than conventional or traditional laser force on droplets? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll let me back up to the slide here real quick. So we see this as a, as a complementary technique. Um, let me back up to the simulation because it actually um, illustrates what's happening here. Um, in traditional optical tweezers, uh, you, you create um, the focused laser beam creates an electromagnetic gradient force. And if the particle that you're trying to trap has a different dielectric constant than the surrounding medium, then that electromagnetic gradient force can actually cause that particle to be attracted to the focal point of the laser beam. And so this is a very powerful technique. Um, it's been used for, uh, for a long time for particle manipulation. It's used in biotechnology. Um, but it is limited to um, smaller particles. So the forces are on the order of um, piconewton with traditional optical tweezers. But with optofluidic tweezers, as you can see, this, the force, the trapping force, is actually caused by the, um, uh, uh, the Marangoni flow uh, generated by the focused laser beam, by this local hot spot here. So uh, this ca causes the droplets to become trapped. I don't have the... Um, time to go into all the details of this, but I would refer you to our paper here. But the fact is that the uh, capillary forces are on the order of micronewtons to tenths of micronewtons, whereas electromagnetic gradient forces are on the order of piconewtons. So it really does give you the ability to manipulate much larger drops, and you can do so with much larger forces. Okay, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, we just have time for two, two more questions, and maybe uh, we, uh, we'll... Uh, if you have more questions, please do uh, send it out, and uh, we'll have it answered via email. Uh, so uh, what the question is, what kind of complex phenomena would you expect to see in case of multiphase droplet formation in which the carrier is a compressible fluid? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah. I, um, if we back up here at the beginning, when I gave these equations here, I actually said that um, in the multiphase model, it begins with a the incompressible form of the Navier Stokes equation. Now, I, I did that just because uh, we're doing liquid liquid uh, interfacial flows, but it doesn't have to be limited to. Um, here we go. Uh, we're doing liquid liquid uh, uh, fluidics, um, but the simulation tool that we're using it definitely has the ability to do incompressible flows as well. For example, if you have water in air droplets, if you have um, gas droplets in liquid, you can do those types of simulations also. Uh, what you'll do is you'll have the, incompress the compressible forms of the conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. I haven't shown that here. There's a few addition there's an additional term here, and there's an additional term in conservation of momentum. So 
computational time increases, but it's still possible to do simulations with um, compressible flows. Okay. Uh, we have one more question from a you but attendee that reads, I have been trying to simulate droplet impact on surface and deformation, but I have found VOF shows better deformation than level set. How do you evaluate it? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I, will, um, I will say I've never really used the uh, volume of fluid method myself. Um, the commercial solver that we're using uses a level set method. <coughs> so I can't give you, um, you know, I can't give you an accurate um, answer to your question. Um, however, like this chart shows the differences. Uh, there's a very good paper, um, if I could refer you to this first paper here written by Olson in the Journal of Computational Physics in 2005. It talks about the level set method and it um, illustrates the advantages of the level set method over the volume of fluid method. Um, if you work with both, you probably have, uh, you may have a better idea than, uh, than I do. Uh, the volume of fluid method, it uses a very sharp transition. The color function, the level set, the variable representing which phase you're at is very sharp at the interface. So uh, that can cause sometimes inaccuracies if you don't have a, a fine enough mesh, okay, uh, because of this discontinuity. The level set method is actually able to handle uh, this, it, because it's based on a diffuse interface, is able to handle some of these surface calculations even if you don't have a very, very finely resolved mesh. So uh, in terms of accuracy, that's one of the, the, uh, the points which makes the level set method. It gives it some advantages. But I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, so uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for that presentation. It was it was wonderful uh, having you here. And uh, to all the participants, thank you for your time. Uh, we will be having more webinars throughout the year. And if you would like to stay updated, uh, please visit our website. Uh, the address is lns.umich.edu slash nnin hyphen at hyphen Michigan. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor, once again. And uh, thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. I also want to mention, if anyone's still online, that uh, uh, if you have any questions about any of these things, I'd be happy to answer them. My email address is on the first uh, slide here, abasu at eng.wayne.edu. Thanks a lot.